so far. So before I begin, I think it's important that we first address what microplastics are exactly and why we're studying the weir. Well, microplastics are small fragments of plastics typically defined as below five millimeters or one millimeter in diameter. With rising global awareness of the impact of plastic pollution to our environment and wildlife, now is as good a time as any to develop our understanding of plastics and begin to understand their potential presence in our other systems. So what's so bad about microplastics anyway? Well, microplastics can be mistaken as food by aquatic life, as plastics of any size do not readily break down. It can result in bioaccumulation and over time lead potentially to limiting reproduction rates and causing physical damage to organisms which ingest them. Although it is important to note that their true impact is not yet entirely understood and research is ongoing. Rivers connect towns and cities to the oceans and therefore they are a main highway network for transferring plastics from us into the sea. Due to their micro size, microplastics can easily move between waterways with ease. Microplastics aren't filtered or treated by water treatment plants due to their size, which provides an easy avenue for plastics to enter the water stream from direct human sources. Our pilot study aims to identify if microplastics are present in the rib weir, and if they are present, or what concentrations and what observable trends we can deduct from our findings. We also aim for our study to promote awareness of the topic and the pressing issues surrounding plastic pollution. Our pilot study involves sampling river water and sediment at five different sites along the River Weir. Our sites are Weirhead, Rosterley, Bishop Auckland, Durham and Chesterby Street, giving us a good mix of areas with different pop population sizes. At each respective site, we've been sampling upstream and downstream of sewage outflow pipes to also determine if they have influence. The first step in our study was to begin our sampling at each of the five decided locations along the weir. Our study began with visiting our weirhead site upstream of an outflow pipe. We measured the depth and the width of the river and used a flow meter to calculate flow rate during sampling. At the start of the study, we needed to establish the optimal time period for leaving the net in the water. And so we conducted our sampling three times for different lengths of time, at five minutes, 10 minutes, and 20 minutes. We stood at the centre of the often cold river with a 100, 100 micron microplankton net positioned halfway under the water with an attached cod end jar and conducted sampling for the chosen length of time. After the correct time passed, we made our way to the river bank and then we used filtered water and sprayed the contents of the net into the cod end jar to ensure any microplastics were not left behind in the net. We repeated this for the rest of the samples and time periods and determined 20 minutes would be most appropriate for sampling. Once we had completed collecting the water samples, we used stainless steel scoops to collect sediment at different points across the riverbed. The sediment samples were then wrapped up in tinfoil, ready for lab analysis. We repeated this method for the sites downstream of the outflow pipes and took blanks for the filtered water throughout the process to determine if the plastic cod end jar or the plastic sprayer were contaminating our samples with additional microplastics. In total, we sampled 10 different sites upstream and downstream of outflow pipes located along the weir. Once we returned to the lab, we began the process of sieving. We had four different size, sized sieves ranging from five millimeter to 100 microns and stacked them in the correct order of size and then tipped the contents of the water sampling jar through them. We then used tweezers and filtered water to separate the contents of the water sample into the appropriate size fractions. And we also decanted them into petri dishes for further analysis. We repeated this process for the rest of the water samples cleaning the sieves with filtered water between each sample and then place them into the lab ovens for drying. The sediment samples followed a very similar process. The contents of each sample were decanted into the sieves and using filtered water and motion, which essentially consisted of shaking the stack of sieves, we separated the sediment into the appropriate size fractions. Each size fraction was then sorted and wrapped 
into label tin foil and then placed in the lab ovens for drying. The periodic blanks were filtered through filter paper and then dried the filter paper before assessing using microscopes. If any microplastics were found present on the filter paper, you would then need to take account of this as part of the study as a potential contaminator and ensure that we were cautious when counting microplastics in our samples as they may have entered the study from other sources, such as through the filtered water, or perhaps it could have been airborne. Once we removed the dried water samples from the oven, we looked at them under the microscope. However, we found that it was difficult to determine a difference between plastics and organics. For example, the eggs that we sometimes found were difficult to distinguish between anything synthetic. And so we needed to find a solution. After researching methods, we decided to use 30% hydrogen peroxide heated at 50 degrees on a hot plate for three hours to digest the organic material. However, before using the hydrogen peroxide directly onto our samples, we tested the process with test plastics to establish if they would react poorly to the digestion. We found that there was little damage to the plastics and we concluded that it would be safe to use the hydrogen peroxide on our samples. We then proceeded to digest all of our water samples before analysis. To identify microplastic presence in the sediment samples, we decided to use heavy liquid at a density of 1.7 grams per mils, which to et al. 2018 identified to be the ideal density for floating microplastics. This method separated the microplastics from the sediment, allowing for ease in isolating the microplastics for further analysis. The remaining sample was filtered onto filter paper, ready for microscope and FTIR analysis. Once all the water samples were digested and the microplastics were separated from the sediment samples, our samples could be thoroughly analysed. We looked at each sample under the microscopes and counted the number of microplastics we found to be present. We used a guide created by one of Dr. Lisa Baldini's contacts to initially identify suspected plastic fibres and fragments. Our technique involved looking at key plastic identifying factors, such as the way light hit the, the plastics compared to organic matter. However, this method took some time to become accustomed to and wasn't the best in being confident that suspected synthetic fibres were indeed plastic. To improve confidence that the plastics we found were indeed plastic, we also used the FTIR machine. This machine allowed us to not only identify if any fibres or fragments were synthetic, but also helped us to identify the exact polymer type present. During the study, Rachel Richards of Durham Wild Life Trust had also conducted litter picks at four of the five sites involving the efforts of local schools. They picked up litter from gravel bars along the river for our analysis. This litter was then processed by Lisa Baldini's first year undergrad environmental science class and analyzed using the FTIR machine. We plan to compare the polymer types identified to understand if there is a link between the macroplastic litter and the microplastics we have found within the weir. As this pilot study is ongoing, we are still working toward the counting and identification of plastics. So far, we have been able to identify plastics at all of the sites at varying concentrations in both the water and sediment samples, but we still need to undergo FTIR analysis to confirm the polymer types. Once this study is completed, we aim to publish our findings. But if you have any questions about our study, please feel free to contact myself via email. And I just want to thank you so much for your time and all of those involved with this project and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day.